Okay. Uh, yeah, so like I say, so today is the last ultrasound lecture uh, for now. It's hard to believe. It's been January, February, March, five months to do something that you can really do in a week if you have eight hours a day to sit and do it. But uh, yeah, we've come quite far. The next week we'll start x-rays and hopefully in a few months, the guys will be okay with x-rays. So, uh, okay, well, this is more for those who might watch the video later, but if you're a bit lost, go back and watch the old videos and then you'll be here in no time. Okay, so today, what we're gonna do is the last thing, which is the focus assessment using sonography in HIV, all right? Or what they call the FASH examination, all right? Now, this was actually developed in South Africa, all right, as compared to some of the other techniques that are actually from overseas, and, you know, initiated by people out of uh, SA. Um, when I say developed in SA, what I mean is a lot of the facets of it were developed in SA. So it's something that we should be proud of. In a way, in a way we shouldn't be proud because it was because of our high prevalence of HIV that a lot of these techniques were actually developed, right? So the FASH examination, uh, very easy actually. Basically what it entails is, what are you looking for in terms of, uh, what are you looking for in terms of HIV, uh, specifically a TB abdomen, all right? And uh, you know, how are you going to differentiate it from other causes of particular illnesses, all right? So in our case, it's important to know, can we have more chairs? I'm sure this chair's outside. Just check along, I'm sure we'll have something. So, okay. So the, the question is, why is it important to know in our context? Number one, the majority of us who are in this group, we are working in district, regional, um, small regional combination hospitals, things like that, which are the bedrock of HIV TB medicine. You know, uh, very few people who work in tertiary hospitals and they're specializing, or if you're very lucky to get a post there, things like that. So we tend to get a high prevalence of patients who have HIV and TB. Okay. And then the thing is, TB abdomen specifically can mimic an acute abdomen to a great extent. You can have peritonitis, acute peritonitis. Uh, all the signs, guarding, tenderness, rebound tenderness, localized tenderness. Uh, you can have everything that goes along with an acute abdomen, in TB abdomen, all right? Uh, your pleural effusions can be exceptionally large with TB and certain HIV conditions and things like that. Pericardial involvement in these patients can kill them. And uh, unfortunately, these patients do poorly if they take them to theater. Because generally, the type of patient that gets this is wasted, behind on fluids, has multiple respiratory, uh, CNS, cardiac complications. So if you get somebody specifically with the TB abdomen, you don't know how to look for it, and then you rush them into theater without being 100% sure. Not to say you will kill them, but I mean, you've increased their, their chance of doing badly, you know? So it's quite important that you know how to differentiate, All right? We're not going to be concentrating only on TB abdomen, but it's kind of the biggest part of it, right? One of the things that we really look at, right? Um, so <laughs> here's all the different propositions, right? So it looks very complex, but it's actually quite easy when you really look at it. It's all the ones we've done before. We've looked at number one, right? Number one is to look at your pericardium, all right? The epigastric uh, angle, all right? Number two, the right axillary line is where we've been looking at the liver and the pleura, things like that, all right? Number three is actually just to look for ascites and look for liver lesions. Number, well, let's go to number four, which is where we've been looking for the spleen all these months, all right? So again, we're looking in this case more for pleural effusion. Number five, again, we're just looking for uh, ascites. You can sometimes see splenic lesions, but not so low down. And number six is the suprapelvic views, where we're looking at the bladder, uterus, and we're just looking for ascites in the culture of so it's nothing new. It's everything that we've covered up till now. It's just that it's more focused towards now assessing HIV and the TB abdomen, all right? So liver ascites, this is liver ascites. Okay, so how do we know it's liver ascites? Simply because we have this room of dark fluid in between the liver and the kidney. It's something we've seen a million times before. Okay, it's not something new, but this presents its own problem. Because now you have this patient who has an acute abdomen, 
and has free fluid. Technically, I'm supposed to rush this patient into theater. Agree. I mean, there's free fluid in this abdomen. And a lot of these patients have low BPs, may even be a history of trauma, we don't know. But a lot of them come without a history of trauma. Just got the sudden onset, severe abdominal pain. Is this a ruptured appendix? Is this a ruptured viscous? You know, is this a, you know, a ruptured uh, PUD, for example? You know, is it a bleeding liver cyst? You know, there's so many things that it could be. So technically speaking, this patient should go into theater. Agreed. So we don't stop there. And say, okay, we've seen liver ascites. So we know this patient definitely has to go for theater. We have to look for other signs. And sometimes that will tell us, listen, is this leaning more towards the TB abdomen? Is this more due to the HIV status of the patient? Or what could it be? That's basically where we're going to go from there. All right. So let's have a look. So this is what ascites looks like if you've never seen it on an ultrasound. Okay. So ascites, by its, by its very nature, does not lead to peritonitis. Okay. So only once you have infective ascites. All right, then you generally get this problem. So in, in uh, ascites, you'll see uh, all the viscera are quite easy to see, specifically the bowel and things like that. Uh, if you go, like, for example, in a super you can see large amounts of fluid. And we have our general physical signs as well. So you guys remember the physical signs? Abdominal distension, fluid throws, the fluid, what's it called? The fluid tap is positive. Yes, shifting dullness, all of that, all the things I don't do anymore because you just look at the patient, yeah, this is a side thing. <laughs> but, but again, it presents a problem for us, specifically in the HIV patient, because this patient is peritonitic a lot of the time. So you're peritonitic with large amounts of free fluid. So these are the first two things that we may notice because they tend to be the biggest things that are showing that it's all right. It's in most of the patients, not all of the patients, all right. So this is just ascites in the pouch of Douglas, all right? So it's just fluid in the pouch of Douglas. Now you hear then you know that they're talking about complex fluid, all right? Now complex fluid in itself, what it means is generally there's areas where you can actually see fiber, right? Or these strands within the fluid. Is this always visible? No. So you can't actually say, oh no, it's absent, so I'm missing it. But if you do see it, all right? So they kind of like these wavy strands that move around in the fluid. You can see this is a sign of TB, and it can start getting you thinking that maybe this is TB abdomen. And just to go one back, sometimes it's even present here. You know, you may get these strands that are just poking out, right? So it's just something to keep in mind, okay? So when we come to the spleen, you all have seen a spleen on ultrasound. So this is a spleen. Does this look like the spleen that we've been looking at before? Not really, is it? Generally, our spleen has a very uniform texture, all right? So it's quite granular. It's generally the same shade of gray throughout. And if you look at this, what you've got is you've got these hypoechoic areas, all right? Which is a fancy way of saying gray areas as compared to white areas, all right? So that's what you see. Now, this in itself is probably the biggest indicator that this could be TB abdomen, or one of the biggest indicators, because these are what you call splenic microabscesses, all right? And again, you can see it on this side, these hypoechoic areas. All right. So once you get splenic microabscesses, right, which are caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis in any case, that's when you start seeing that this could be a TB abdomen. The one thing that you notice as well is that you still have fluid everywhere. Okay, so you've got fluid where we would expect to find fluid in the trauma vein, for example. All right, so we've got fluid in between the spleen and the kidney, in between the spleen and the diaphragm. This is where we expect to see fluid in your trauma victim. And in this case, anybody know what's going on here? because this is in the chest cavity, this is a pleural effusion, all right? So these are, these are the kind of findings that you would find in TB abdomen. And once you start seeing these types of things, then you've got to, your mind has to start focusing from, okay, this is a patient with an acute abdomen to this is a patient with a TB abdomen that's mimicking an acute abdomen. You remember we had one patient and we thought we saw one of these, but we weren't 100% sure, all right? So with Dr. Guilive, then what we did was you put query, TB abdomen, because what will happen is those are the types of patients, these are lovely pictures, you know, where there's no doubt, right? But there, some of your patients you get, it may be, it may not be. Uh, the history is suggestive, the patient is suggestive, but is it really? So you get these things, and then you've got to say query because there are people more qualified to make a more qualified diagnosis than anything, all right? Radiologists, for example, all right? So you would send this that type of patient to a radiologist and say, please do a formal ultrasound. They can spend a lot more time, much better equipment, different types of probes, have a look at different areas and decide, listen, this could be a TB abdomen. If failing that, do a CT scan. 
feeling that take the patient to theater, find nothing, biopsy the peritoneum, and confirm that it is TB or not. All right. So this is remember, these are just guides to get you going in the right direction. Okay. So remember this picture of splenic microabscesses. Okay. So uh, uh you are our designated chair finder for today. <laughs> All right. Bring a chair if you come. Bolivia has got nowhere to go. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the other thing that we do see, and this is also one of the big indicators of uh, TB abdomen, is periaortic lymph nodes. All right. So these are your lymph nodes that follow along the uh, aorta. All right. So here we have the aorta, the, the, the abdominal aorta, the uh, distal third of it. It's then uh, what you call it, uh, dividing into the two common iliacs and then eventually the two common femorals. So these are the lymph nodes that are generally present around there. So we don't concentrate too much on these. We're actually looking at these periaortic lymph nodes, all right? So anybody who's dealt with TB, what do we find in our patients? Yeah, mesenteric lymph nodes, mesenteric lymphadenitis. But what I'm saying is generally, how do your TB patients present? How do we get a lot of our TB patients? cervical lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes, papillary lymph nodes, inguinal lymph nodes, because TB has the tendency to make lymph nodes expand. Agreed. So in TB peritonitis, there's no doubt, or TB, yeah, TB abdomen, you will get the mesenteric ones, all right? But the mesenteric ones are very difficult to make out when you have to look at bowel and things like that. So what we tend to do is we tend to concentrate on the paraaortic ones, and we try to see if those are enlarged, all right? So what we have is we have the aorta. So if you've forgotten how we look at the aorta, we place the, uh, our umbilicus is more or less here, all right? So we place the probe in a horizontal fashion, just over there. We look for the vertebra and above that we have the aorta. And once we find the aorta, we then place it in a, uh, what you call it, vertical position. So we end up seeing the aorta in this orientation. And then we start looking around for these swellings, all right? Now the question becomes, how do I know it's bowel or how do I know it's a lymph node? And the truth is that a lymph node is a little self-contained thing. It's blind ending. So when you start scanning through, you'll see this thing that kind of grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks, all right? Because it's a little ball. So that gives you this idea that this could be a periodic lymph node. Now, these are very lovely, but very often you don't see them like this. And right? these are teaching pictures. That's why they put them here, all right? But what I'm saying is that if you see these periodic lymph nodes, along with the clinical picture, along with the spleen, along with the scientists, you got to start thinking, is this a TB abdomen? Now, this doesn't mean you don't involve the surgical team because your patient is still peritonitic. But what you are doing is you are giving them a differential. You're saying this could be a TB abdomen. So it tells you where you've got to push this patient beyond. And sometimes you get patients with TB abdomen who are not peritonitic. They're not peritonitic. They just have severely sore abdomens. You know, we all have those patients. We've had them before. My stomach's been paining for a week. You can press that thing and jump on it. It's fine. But the patient's in a lot of pain. And if you find these signs, then you can start thinking this could be TB abdomen. Right. So TB abdomen can be present without peritonitis. Okay. Now, this is a pleural effusion. All right. So this, again, we have a look at the two sides. All right. Any idea which side we're looking at here? The right side or the left side? This is the left side. All right. That's the spleen. Okay, and this is the tip of the lung. All right, you can see it just swimming around over there, All right? Because it's surrounded by fluid. Okay, so these are also things that our TB and HIV patients tend to develop. All right, so um, depending on the underlying organism, it can be quite large or it can be quite small. But this starts to tell you that listen, this patient has evidence of HIV, TB, and things like that. All right. So these are just the parts of the assessment that we're going through. So, so far we've had to look at the liver. We've had to look at the general abdomen. We've had to look at suprapubic, splenic, aortic views. And putting all of these together, you kind of get the picture that this could be TB abdomen, HIV related pathology. Okay. And the major thing to try and figure out is, is this, an, an, especially if the patient has peritonitis, is this an acute abdomen or is this a TB abdomen that's mimicking? and acute abdomen, all right? So these are some of the things that we find, all right? Oops, what happened there? All right, sorry, that was just, a, uh, I must have skipped a slide. Now, we're gonna get onto one of the most dangerous things because remember, TB abdomen is not gonna kill your patient, not at all. Your patient's gonna be in a lot of pain. 
severe amounts of pain. I mean, some of these patients go on pethidine, morphine, high doses for a good amount of days. They get discharged, they come back again, they have to be on their TB treatment, but they still need analgesia because it really, it, it is extremely painful, all right? But the one thing that can kill them is a pericardial effusion, all right? Now, why is it so dangerous? Now, let's have a look, all right? So this is in the short axis view, and this is in the long axis view, all right? So TB pericarditis or TB pericardial effusions, or sometimes you just have straightforward inflammatory effusions. The problem with these, and we've covered it before, is that quite simply, they constrict the heart, okay? Any effusion, be it a traumatic effusion, non-traumatic effusion, pushes down on the heart. So your heart cannot expand. And for your heart to be able to contract, your heart must be able to expand. Starling's law, all right? So the, as you stretch your heart, it rebounds. Stretch your heart, it rebounds. You cannot stretch your heart, you cannot rebound. You cannot produce any output, okay? So, uh, and of course, you cannot get any inflow into the heart as well. You cannot expand, so you cannot draw blood in. So this is actually what kills patients very quickly, all right? So what makes you think that it could be a, 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 a TB effusion, for example? In TB pericardial effusions, you tend to get a large amount of these fibrous structures, fibrous strands that are going through. Can you see them here? All right, kind of makes the heart look like a little spider dancing around. Okay, so that's actually what tells us that it is TB, all right, in a lot of cases. And what's the treatment for this? Any idea? Pericardial tap, pericardiocentesis, very good, all right. So pericardiocentesis is a life-saving procedure in this case, all right. So we covered pericardiocentesis in one of the earlier lectures, but basically what you're going to do is that you're going to go either zephysternal or from the third or fourth intercostal space from the apex, you're introducing a needle inside over there to withdraw fluid, okay. Once you withdraw the fluid, then you guys have put up CVPs already, especially the interns, some of your students, you've put up or seen CVPs at least, all right. So it's the exact same thing as putting up a CVP, except that instead of putting up a CVP, you're introducing your port into this area. Now you get specific pericardiocentesis packs. It looks ex exactly the same as a CVP pack, except that the port, you know, that the thing that we actually, uh, uh, let's just say our gel core, our cannula. It, uh, the CVP cannula is a little bit short. This tends to be a little bit longer, right? And a little bit thinner. But what it means is that basically you can use a CVP set as a pericardiocentesis pack. Well, right. The only difference will be that it would sit a little bit deeper. Okay. So th there's a few technicalities. I wouldn't suggest doing it if you've never done one. It's one of those where it's not even see one, do one, teach one. It's see one, see another five, do one under supervision, then do one, teach one. You get what I mean? It's one of those types of procedures because if you hit the heart, you can cause severe damage. Right. So it's not one of those that you just rush ahead and do. Oh yeah, I remember in 2021 when I was an intern, Dr. Mohammed did one. Now it's 2035. I've been working. In I'm going to try. No, 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 you can't do that, right? You have to make sure you know what you're doing, all right? But basically, the whole, the whole thing is as soon as you relieve the pressure of that effusion, the heart goes back to normal. The problem is the effusion will recur. So you need to leave something inside so that you don't have to keep on tapping so that you can just continue to remove, all right? So these ones here, they're not life-threatening. You can do it formally with a radiologist. You do it in a, in a theater. But for example, if you have one like this, I mean, look at this heart. The right heart has completely collapsed. The left heart can barely function. You're not gonna wait half an hour. You need to get that fluid out, or at least significant amounts of the fluid out within the next five to 10 minutes, all right? As compared to this one. Now, this is TB pericarditis, all right? Now, I don't want to get into the technicalities of pericarditis uh, on ultrasound because it's one of those things that's a bit subjective as well. But basically, we have a pericardial effusion, and what we have here is swelling of the pericardium as well. Now, in this case here, what we can see is that we've still got a functional, oh, sorry, we've still got a functional right heart, we've still got a functional left heart. So we wouldn't rush, you know, to remove everything in the emergency department. This is one that we could do more formally in an, a, a sterile setting, make sure we have the exact right equipment and things like that, all right? Depending, of course, on the clinical presentation of the patient, okay? But just to give you an idea of what it looks like, okay? But this is the thing that can kill your patient with HIV. Okay, so those are the <laughs> so those are the things that we look for, right? Now I, I just go. I just want to go back to the, the the slide that we had about the probe positioning, just so that you guys can re remember it, right? While we're having a think about questions and things like that, all right? So this is the type of thing where, and the thing that we've covered over the last few months, 
was mainly trauma, right? What do we do in cases of trauma? How do we assess trauma? How do we make sure that our trauma patient is properly assessed using ultrasound? And then how do we move forward from there? So this is a little bit of a departure from that, but it just shows you that not everything is related to trauma, okay? And in fact, when we revisit ultrasound again, you guys will be comms by that time probably, all right? So we're still on the group that can watch the videos. Okay. So most likely, once we finish up other topics and we go back, there's so much to ultrasounds and the emergency department that doesn't have to do with trauma. But trauma is the most important part. So this is just a little introduction to non-traumatic ultrasound. Okay. So um, sorry. So this is just a revision. Now you've had your patient who's come in. Most of these patients are wasted, severe pain, hypotensive, anemic. You know, the typical signs of advanced HIV, all right? And these are the things that we look for. What are you going to do for these patients? Basically, you are trying to prevent them from going to theater because they will not do well in theater. You are trying to see that if they have pleural effusions, you can tap those pleural effusions to allow them to breathe better, all right? And in fact, you can use your ultrasound to even guide your taps and things like that, which we'll learn later on. I'm not going to trouble you all with that now because it's not complex, but... <sighs> digest what we've already learned, all right? Let's put it that way. And you're making sure that you are trying to, they don't have a life-threatening pericardial effusion. So these are the things that you are looking for in your HIV patient. Do you have to do it for every patient who comes in RVD positive? No, you don't have to. The guy came in with a dog bite, you don't have to throw him on the, the bed and do an ultrasound for him. But if he's HIV positive with an acute abdomen, no history of trauma, there's no harm in taking five minutes and putting a probe on him. All right, and saying, listen, could this be TB abdomen? And it doesn't mean you must come to a diagnosis, but at least you can think, okay, is it or is it not? And some patients are not clear cut. I always think about that patient we had recently, but it wasn't clear cut, you know? She had signs, she was wasted, she didn't look well, but she didn't have all the classic signs. She had one query large node next to the aorta, one query abscess, microabscess in the spleen, but we weren't sure. And that's the majority of your patients. Most of your patients will not present as these pictures are, right? There's a reason why these pictures are there because, wow, you know, <laughs> and see everything. So let's put it up and let people learn. From it. Okay. But I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that a little bit. From next week, we're actually going to start with x rays, all right? So we're going to start from the head down and things like that. So we'll start learning more about x rays. I know everybody thinks x rays is chest x rays. Test x-rays are part of x-rays, but there's a lot of x-rays that people don't know how to read. In fact, most of you are very good at reading chest x-rays because they drill it into your head from the time you enter med school. Agreed. Most med school applications have a chest x-ray as part of the application process. You know, it's part of the monogram or, you know, the application letter. So we need, and then the problem is when patients come with other things, we don't know what to do. Okay. So we'll start learning about those things and get to chest x-rays and things like that towards the end. But for right now, we've actually concluded ultrasound. So if you haven't had a chance to look through these lectures, go back at your leisure. Sometime you're sitting around, you watch everything on Netflix now, you have nothing else to watch. Even Amazon Prime is not doing it for you anymore. Then you sit and you, uh, you know, and Showmax is too expensive. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you pull out the ultrasound lectures and you start looking at them from there. Okay, so uh, it's a nice thing to practice as well. Even on patients who are not necessarily peritonitic, not necessarily having trauma, your patients love it when you do things for them, right? And we know that, uh, it's psychology, right? So even when we are feeling sick, even if we don't know exactly what the person is checking for, but just as long as they are checking us, we are happy, right? Go tomorrow, even you as a doctor, go to a cardiothoracic surgeon, and for some reason, keeps on percussing on your chest in one particular area, just because he's trying to hear if his phone is really ringing in the next room, you have no idea, all right? But the fact remains he's doing something for you. You're getting happy, all right? This cardiothoracic spent five minutes just on my fourth intercostal space, middle of the line. I don't know what he was checking for, but it was amazing, you know what I mean? So even when you get your patients, put a probe on them and have a look and see if something's going on or not, right, for your own practice, okay? All right, so we'll end it there. And then uh, if there are any questions later on, you guys can message me as well. Uh, but yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed. Okay, and bye to the people on Zoom. Thank you very much.